So I'm just here to present a really interesting person. Um, his, his name is Brian Foote. Ooh, I like that. Hey, yeah. It's, well, it sounds like a machine. Okay, it's not working anyway. So, uh, Brian, Brian Foote is uh, an inspiration for a lot of people, including me. Uh, he was there at the beginning of the frameworks era. He was uh, there at the beginning of the patterns, design patterns era. Um, he was there when the uh, man got to the moon. He was helping, <laughs> helping the guy. He gave his first step. Um, he's brilliant, and I, I adore his uh, thinking and his ways. And he's a great, great guy. So please <laughs> clap for him. No. No? <laughs> All right, no, fine. Okay. So, so this only goes to the recording, right? At some point. Flip. Should have premeditated all these things. Put this one here. Any of the mics live, or should we use this one first? You use it. Well, okay. All right, we'll try that one. Hello. Oh, that works really well. So, hi, my name is Brian. I'm from the uh, the northern hemisphere, and uh, to be precise, I'm from Urbana, Illinois. And in Urbana, Illinois, I have this uh, big library of. Um, primitive 15th century um, you know, information conveyance technology. They used to call them books. They used to be popular. We used to have a lot of them. I have a whole room full of these things. And one of the things I've noticed about um, you know, being in the computer world is a whole lot of the books I have about computers um, just uh, are completely stale. You know, I could put them in a dumpster. I could get rid of them. I literally haven't looked at some of them in 20 years. The ones you still look at are things like math books, statistics books. There's a lot of things that hold up. There's a lot of things you can talk about 20 years later that still make sense. And oddly enough, some of the stuff that still makes sense is the stuff I have in my library uh, about small talk. Now, this particular talk here is based in part on a set of slides that I delivered at uh, Small Talk Solutions in New York City back in 1999. Was anyone? Yes, someone was there. And, uh, it was called a, a small talk pattern safari. And the, the idea was to spelunk around the small talk image, the visual work image, and see whether or not we could find examples of uh, design patterns. And um, you know, 20, 25 years on, you know, there have been, been a number of you know, additional variants. There's probably a much richer vein of source code to go spelunking for patterns in. But a lot of these um, basic observations still hold up. Uh, a lot of what was in that wound up being reusable, which was something I'd been interested in for uh, quite some time when I'd gotten to Small Talk Solutions in 1999. So I know you guys do uh, a lot of looking at patterns here. A lot of you have taken courses where you look at design patterns, even in Small Talk. So this won't be based on you know, the latest packages. Instead, uh, this is going to be based on some observations I've made from being on the patterns planet for maybe longer than might have been good for a person. I'm going to give you a little background on how I got there and, uh, in essence, how I got here so you can tell where I'm coming from with all of this. Let's see. This one goes, oh, yeah, like that. This is a slide that I have used in just about any patterns-based talk I've ever done. And uh, one of the things I enjoy doing was asking for a show of hands as to who recognizes who the man in the red dinner jacket is. And by and large, I get no nibbles. I've done this well over 100 times, and there's only been two occasions when people have actually recognized him. And it looks like this isn't going to be one of them. So 
Any guesses? Okay, I'll tell you. That man is the late John Lennon. He was uh, a member of a, uh, a British band called the Beatles, as some of you may be aware. And this is literally a scene from a nightmare. This is a nightmare that Lennon had, I believe, in uh, 1967, after having consumed a little too much LSD, as was the custom during those days. He woke up and he had this nightmare, and he envisioned himself shoveling load after load of spaghetti into drummer Ringo Starr's Aunt Jessie's lap. And at the time, they were making a movie called Magical Mystery Tour, which uh, turned out to be the first vinyl record album that I ever bought way back during that period. And uh, they included that scene in that movie. If you, you know, download the movie, you can find it on, uh, I think you can find it on YouTube now. You can find this scene. It really is kind of horrific. Shovel load after shovel load of spaghetti. Um, and that stuck with me. You know, it, it kind of made an impression. So, what I'd like to do then is uh, fast forward later into my own misspent youth. Um, when I got out of uh, college at the University of Illinois in Urbana, back in the Northern Hemisphere, which is where I still live, um, I got this job working for a bunch of guys who were collecting brain waves. And they were using the uh, latest, uh oh, this guy's going a little flaky on us, isn't it? Is that me? Okay. Do I have to hold it further away? It sounds pretty, yeah. Okay. Mike Swap. Hello. Whoa. Okay. Anyway, where were we? Oh, yes, my misspent you. Uh, I was around a bunch of guys who were close. Yes. Terrible? Yeah, screw it. I can talk loud. I can fill this room. This can be done, you know. <laughs> Well, pretend we're in the parliament in 1899. You know, I can do this. Anyway, back during that period, you can hear, right, with the, uh, the camera, so presumably. OK, good. OK, here was the deal. I was working with these guys who were collecting brain waves in the psychology department at, at, the, at the University of Illinois. And uh, what they had to do was write programs for primitive PDP-11s in order to collect these brain waves and run A to D converters. And their goal in those days, they had a lot of military money, you know, which uh, kept us really busy. And uh, th their goal was to be able to read minds fast enough to know when a fighter pilot wanted to fire his weapon system before the other guys. You know, if you ever saw the uh, Clint Eastwood movie Firefox, where the Russians had these planes that could read your brain waves and could, you know, just have an advantage in combat, this was you know, a lovely fantasy, and that's the idea that these guys were pursuing. But that was our side that was doing this, at least the American side, during that period of time. And it almost worked. You know, in the end, we could predict the intent to you know, engage in the motor uh, activity that would result in the firing of the weapon system with about 90% accuracy, which is pretty good for anything but firing a weapon system. So it wound up never being particularly practical. And uh, you know, as a result, you know, we figured we're taking their money. It's not really being used to hurt anybody. But you know, here was what the impact that had on me. I was working with some of the smartest people I'd ever met. And you know, they were you know, PhD students in psychology. And you know, they were really, really good at what they did. But they were the worst programmers I'd ever met in my life. They, they would write these horrific Fortran programs that collected the data. They didn't really care whether they were any good. And uh, when they needed another one, what do you think they did? They didn't go back to first principles and write something nice and clean that you know, embodied all the assumptions behind running their experiment. No, no, no. They took the one that the last person had, uh, had used. They would copy and paste it. We talked about this yesterday, if anyone w was there. So then you'd have two programs, and then they'd do it again, then you'd have four, then you'd have eight, then you'd have 16. You know, it's the metastasis, it's a cancer cell, it was spread. So my job was to deal with this mess so that they could get their work done quickly. And I realized that John Lennon's nightmare had become my nightmare too. <laughs> I was dealing with shovel load after shovel load of spaghetti code. And I wanted to know what to do about it. And uh, that's what led me to the National Computer Conference in 1981, where a programming language called Smalltalk was being unveiled by the 
the Goldbergs and you know, all the players, you know, all the people in the small talk pantheon. Yes, I see some people back there raising their hands back and forth. And I, learned, I, you know, I saw this and said, that's what I need. That's what I want. That's what I want to have to be able to accommodate these things, which are basically the same program, but just basically the same thing, but had these little variations around the edges. You know, I just wanted to write the variations. I didn't want 15 or 16 copies, which were impossible to maintain, or, you know, written by other people. And I could see when, you know, we saw small talk, it had the windows, it had all that great stuff. And this is also the year that they unveiled the Xerox perk. So this was the first chance you got to see a windowed user interface anywhere. And you looked at all of this and said, this is the future. Everybody's going to want to do this. This is happening. I want a board. And it was. It really was. And uh, that's what happened. I think we all know that. So this quest led me where? By 1984, it was possible to get your hands on a machine called the Apple Lisa. And this was the first machine you could get your hands on that was capable of running small talk at a price next, less than $100,000. So I was working with uh, my brother-in-law's company, and he was able to get the developer discount on the Lisa, and so we got it for you know, the, a mere pittance, a mere $5,000 in you know, 1984 money. But you know, this was the first blush of, doc, you know, of the, uh, the microcomputer revolution startup you know, kind of bonanza. And so you know, we were a little flush at the time. So I picked up one of these things, and I finally got my hands on Smalltalk. But I needed to know what to do with it. And uh, lo and behold, back in 1985, a fellow by the name of Ralph Johnson arrived at the University of Illinois. And uh, I immediately grabbed this guy and told him what I wanted to do. You know, I want to use objects to build this hierarchy of things that has pluggable parts and you know, allows me to accommodate you know, this range of different things that define these applications I was using at work and getting DARPA money to, to build. And our collaboration began. And it, it turned out that that interest was precisely what objects were supposed to be good for. So immediately we realized, I mean, more or less immediately, that the thing we were talking about building was something that came to be called a framework. We, we came across a paper by uh, Peter Deutsch, the brilliant VM architects of the era, uh, ever, uh, total genius. And he kind of identified exactly that same kind of move. And he didn't really need to identify it, because you could learn it yourself by looking at the small talk image. That was the thing that was amazing about looking at small talk. At first, it was bewildering. But you very quickly came to realize that you were getting the best apprenticeship in object-oriented programming you could ever have wanted just by looking around that source code. And um, that's an enduring contribution. I mean, the, I think uh, if any of you heard my um, pattern talk yesterday, the biggest change I've seen over the last you know, 20 years, uh, this century basically, is just the cornucopia of things that are available in source form, the things you can learn from them. I mean, one of the benefits of being able to read the code and see how it works is you get ideas from it. You learn what other people are doing. You learn what the price of admission is. And this was really the first place you could do this. This was uh, the first time something like that was available. And so there you had it. You had the worked example of what a framework was. And uh, so we went on to you know, study reuse and uh, study frameworks. And a whole lot of stuff, you know, my collaboration with that group, you know, in some ways it's never really ended. I see everybody. But we worked together on and off until uh, 2006 in various capacities. And it's a fascinating history. And, so, and some of it's a little beyond the scope of uh, you know, this particular discussion, because I want to tell you how we got the patterns. But uh, you know, out, out of that research group, you know, uh, all kinds of luminaries came out of it. But, uh, you know, we looked at, uh, you know, our group was among the first to look at reuse at all. You know, designing reusable classes was a paper Ralph and I did way back in, I don't know, 1987? I don't remember. Um, frameworks, um, small talk itself, I think 
UIUC and Carleton were the North American power players in uh, looking at small talk and applying it in research context. Reflection, of course, that's what I'll be getting, doing a deep dive on in the keynote on, on, on Friday. But you know, beyond that, other technologies, refactoring. I mean, if any of you know what refactoring is, that was uh, invented by Bill Opdyke and Ralph and everybody just talking about what we did when we cleaned code up during the late 80s, incredibly influential stuff. But, let me get a quick slow water here. What I want to talk about for the uh, remainder of this, uh, this long talk is, um, is design patterns. Uh, during the early 90s, uh, Ralph came back from some conferences and we were surprised to see him enamored with a, um, a set of books by a rogue architect from Berkeley, um, Chris Alexander, on something called you know, pattern languages for building spaces, for building buildings, for building architects, uh, you know, for building uh, architected spaces, uh, cities, you know, even nations. And we started reading his books. We started going through sections of a pattern language and um, timeless way of building, you know, the, uh, the primary sources for patterns. And it was unlike anything I had seen. You know, it was, um, for one thing, I loved the writing. It was really florid, it was very gushy, it was almost poetic. It was nothing like computer science writing. You know, I used to be fr frustrated writing computer science papers that you know, if you used a phrase in a you know, kind of colorful fashion, they would tell you to tone it down because scientists aren't supposed to write like that. You know, they're supposed to be kind of you know, uh, modest in their uh, um, use of vocabulary. And this guy was not. This was really good writing. It was really, really very colorful. But you know, to cut to the chase, the thing that we took from it was this idea that there were things that people knew, there were things that people had learned about object-oriented programming that no one had ever written down. I mean, the way you win if you're an academic is you have new ideas that are yours and you publish them. You do something original and then you get famous because no one else had that idea. Suddenly there was this space where we decided, you know, talking about things other people have been doing, you know, for thousands of years that no one had ever written down worked out seemingly well for Chris Alexander. How come we don't have something like that? There are all kinds of things that you learn from looking at what other people have been doing right that, you know, at that point, you know, in the late 80s and early 90s, no one had ever written down. But everybody kind of knew them. And in our case, in the realm of object-oriented programming, the reason that we were the everybody's who kind of knew that stuff is because we had been diving around in the small talk images. And we saw all this stuff that uh, people who were starting to employ explore the space of objects had learned about how to build objects. And they weren't our ideas, we were just getting them for free because we could go in there, we could explore, we could spelunk, you know, kind of like cave diving. And it was an amazing experience. And uh, it's, in the end, what led me to be here today. So, you know, great explorers like Livingstone and Johnson are fond of finding things, but you know, often their, their greatest skills are communication. And that was the case with Ralph, such a clear writer, innovator. Okay, so let's talk about some of the other, uh, other characters in this play during that era. Martin Fowler, I like to say, is a pretty good writer for an Englishman. He's a very charming fellow, and um, he's good at popularizing things. I think he was, he was best known for popularizing refactoring. In fact, a lot of people think he invented it, but he was very, you know, very gracious about you know, showing up at universities and finding out what this refactoring thing was about, you know, what was going on with it. And you know, he was one of the people who was a catalyst in encouraging John Brandt and uh, Don Roberts to build the first refactoring browsers, code that a lot of you probably have on your laptops right now in, in some form. But um, it's also good at popularizing things. And so he wound up being one of the players in the tale. Uh, here's another guy. Joshua Karievsky wrote a book called Refactoring the Patterns. It was uh, based on Java. 
But in terms of my own personal history, um, Josh is someone that uh, I met on the Patterns Planet when we first started having Patterns Conferences in 94. And um, he wound up getting a really you know, big run of gigs to teach design patterns to um, people at Google during the um, latter part of the last decade, you know, maybe from, I don't know, 2006 through 2011. And I got to do a lot of those gigs, knowing more about patterns than was, was good for a person. So um, Google was fascinating. You know, it's, um, Google Campus is a lot like Starfleet Academy. You know, all their needs, you know, if they need a computer, if they need food, it would just appear, you know. And, uh, you know, everybody, you know, there, there are people from every known inhabited planet in the universe speaking perfect English. You know, that's exactly what it was like, Starfleet Academy. And they were all hungry to learn about these things. And these things were the design patterns canon. Oh, another player. I don't, I don't want to forget about Kent Beck. Um, when you got an Apple Lisa back in the old days, um, it didn't come with small talk. You had to get it under the table. It was kind of like a drug deal. So I, I remember going to one of the first Oopsalas, and there was this guy I'd never heard of that Ralph had hooked me up with. And we actually got some floppy disks under the table because uh, Apple had a Skunk Works version of uh, small talk that was running on the Lisas. He, this guy could get me one. And that's the first time I met him. But you know, this is another, another one of those people who, you know, if they do one clever thing in their career, it might have been an accident. But you know, this guy was into small talk. He was basically one of the people who brought the idea of patterns to the table. You know, he was one of the people who invented the testing framework. And oh yeah, when he was a little bored, he invented extreme programming. I mean, you can just go down to the list of the things that this guy has done. And uh, you know, after a while, you just kind of have to concede. You know, maybe he's pretty smart. And uh, I think he's at Facebook now. Some of you probably track his posts. But this, okay, this is probably boilerplate for all of you. What's a pattern, a problem which occurs over and over again in our environment and then describes the core of a solution to that problem in such a way that you can use the solution a million times over without doing it in the same way. Now, why is this important for the purposes of uh, this discussion? Um, we're going to talk about small talk. I mean, this is basically, I'm going to get back to uh, the reason that we're here. But... One of the things I, I think you all realize, but I'm going to spell out anyway, is one of the coolest things about having been on the small talk planet for, what is it, 30, 35 years, is one of the things that you see is this flow of ideas that has had a much wider scope of influence than just the language itself. Now, one of the cool things about small talk is there are now more small talkers around than there have ever been. It's a bigger community, it's a bigger universe. I checked this out with Suzanne, this is a true statement, you know, than it has ever been. It's just maybe a smaller fraction of a much bigger expanding universe. I mean, we're living in a redshift universe and it has expanded tremendously, but we're in a bigger space now than we ever have been. It's, it's actually good news. Uh, I hadn't, re you know, I hadn't thought about that to that extent, but this collection of patterns, I'm gonna go through them, you know, yeah, that's kind of boring. Um, this collection of patterns has had such a pervasive impact on not just the OO community, but beyond that into, you know, the neo-functional realm or whatever the cool kids are doing this week, you know, that um, it, it's worth dissecting where some of these things came from. This is the slide where I normally say that the visual works image is the best apprenticeship and object-oriented programming that a boy could ever have had. So let's talk about this one. Um, one of the things I, I you know, wanted to remind myself to do if I was going to talk about patterns in the wild again was to um, you know, get out a copy of this book. This is the uh, Design Patterns Small Talk Companion. This was uh, published back in, was it, 94, 95, something like that. I don't know. I could look. It's really old. 94. <laughs> I, yeah. Um, 
But the point is, if you had this book and you had small talk, you really didn't need the Gang of Four book. This was the one that you actually wanted to read. And I wanted to remind myself to um, you know, go through it and look at some of their known uses in visual work so I could remind myself what they were. And when I dredged up that 1999 talk, I looked at some of the slides in it and realized I'd had exactly the same thought then as well, and that that's what I did. So I've got some reminders of what some of those things are. But, okay. One of the things you learned early on by looking at what good object-oriented programmers do is that there is first a phase where when you've got variation, you used inheritance to deal with it. And that's where template methods started to come from. You know, you got something that's a, a lot like the thing that's going to be your parent. You can kind of push the things that are in common up into the, uh, you know, up into a, a superclass, which will presumably then start to look abstract and, uh, you know, start and then you know, the, the things that are different will wind up being in the subclasses. And when we first saw this proposed as a pattern, it was kind of, duh. You know, everyone who's looked at an object already in code base ought to know this already. But of course, the duh test is a fundamental test of patternhood. Because what you're supposed to be doing is writing down things that everybody already knows. And it's seen all over the place, but no one's ever bought it to write down. But you know, more importantly, in terms of the way that we were looking at software evolution and reuse, this was the first step on the road to things that were more interesting. And this was you know, obviously one of the ones that, you know, when Ralph got to the table with three C++ guys and they started trying to do a design patterns catalog, it was a much lighter lift to have already recognized this than it was for the C++ers, oddly enough. So they're all over the image. Um, I think everybody knows that. They're uh, plentiful as sawgrass in the veldt. I think I remember thinking it was a good idea to uh, you know, treat a tour of the image as a safari in 99. I think I feel guiltier about you know, encouraging people to think about big game hunting now, and I didn't really encourage it then. So think of this as a photo safari. You know, no objects will be harmed during the uh, you know, delivery of this talk. So. Now, we're going to get into a swath of patterns here where the history is interesting. Um, the creational patterns wound up having the shape they did in Gang of Four history because some of the peculiar needs of the C++ community. You know, they needed something that they euphemistically called a virtual constructor. What the heck is that? You know, it's, it's why, should, you know, why should that have been the case? You know, it, it's, um, it's, it's interesting to look at what Strewstrip was faced with when he was designing C++, and it really was a monumental challenge. How do you get C to kind of smell like an object-oriented language without having to build a runtime system like the uh, Objective-C people did on top of it? And one of the compromises he had to make was to come up with the idea of, of constructors. But constructors have limitations. They have lots of limitations, and some of these patterns wound up dealing with limitations that arose from that decision. But you know, that said, we did have things that smelled like factories in the small talk world. We had um, you know, stuff like that. We already had meta classes. We could send meta classes messages, and those, those particular objects were, in effect, factory objects, what meta classes were. And, and so this was a problem that small talkers didn't feel as acutely during that era. But it was nonetheless worth pondering. Because as you got into the more exotic patterns in the Gang of Four canon, you started to realize that they were, they were solving an interesting problem, which is, what if you don't want to, what if you want to create an object and you don't want to have the concrete class of the object be wired into the logic behind the creation? I mean, what if you wanted to start to make it more abstract? You know, what if I wanted to be able to make a person and return, say, a subclass like, you know, baby or elderly person or adult or something of that sort? You'd want to start burying that in something. And so this idea of creating things that allowed you to decouple the returned object types from the, um, you know, from the invocation wound up being a good thing. And it, it turns out to be the case that, uh, you know, of course, small talkers had discovered all of that. We'll get to that one in a minute. But th th there was a, a family of these things. You, know, you, you went up the hierarchy from factory method to um, abstract factory. 
then you'd uh, you know, get into things like Builder and, and what have you. And you know, they could become increasingly elaborate. Um, abstract Factory sort of you know, solved the problem of, gee, I want to build a car, and I want to build it in my garage, OK? And uh, I don't want, you know, I, I had this theory it might be cheaper if I just went to the auto parts store and got all the parts. But I have to make sure if I'm building a Toyota that I get Toyota parts. And if I'm building a, a Chrysler, I get Chrysler parts. So you know what you basically do is put together a table of constructors and then make sure that it uniformly re returned all the, the right parts. And it was clever. However, if you decided that you were, you know, you would have preferred to have a car already built, someone has to know how to take all those parts on the floor of your garage and put them together. And uh, that was the problem that uh, Builder started to solve. And these were, both of these patterns, you know, the, the intermediate factories, were things that you would see anywhere object-oriented programming was done. They were, they were visible in palpable forms in the small talk images. And you know, people like uh, you know, Lacides and Helm and, and, and the whole gang of four game gang, you know, had all stumbled across, and Eric, of course, it, it had all stumbled across these in their C++ work in graduate school, too. So there was broad agreement that in some way they were on the right track with these things. But when you talk to people like Ralph these days, they, they wish they could refactor this space you know, a, a little bit. You know, they missed factory object, and they realized that the, the idea of factory, the idea of, you know, for one thing, even simpler things than factory method for creating objects should have been called out. You know, basically what we do with uh, you know, meta objects and small talk. I think at one point there was a push to call those creation methods. You know, Josh Karievsky was a big advocate of that, but uh, never really stuck. You know, names outside the gang of 423 just haven't seemed to stick. It's, uh, we used to wonder how many there would be beyond 23, and nothing really beyond that has stuck with the same tenacity, you know, the, the same stubbornness as the Gang of Four canon. So let's go, I, I throw this one in here because it's one we, we, we like to talk about. Um, this is a cool pattern. I think it's a really horrible name, uh, actually. Because what I really think of, uh, when I think about dependency injection, I really think of it as a reflective builder on steroids. You know, um, it, it, it's really, you know, I guess, you know, Hollywood directors are in the news lately, you know. Um, what it's really doing is being a casting director, and it's doing it dynamically. You know, who is right for this part, you know? Do I want Jack Nicholson here today, or do I want his stunt double for testing, you know? What am I trying to do? That's basically what this pattern is doing for you. It's starting up your program, and it's saying somewhere out there in the possible pantheon of actors to play certain roles is an appropriate player for today's needs. You know, so when you're, when you're doing a screen test, you don't need the leading man because he's expensive. Um, when you're doing a full-blown production, maybe you do. You bring everybody on stage. And so what you see with the creational patterns is just increasing abstraction and an increasing, increasingly dynamic set of potentials to pick the right objects, you know, to pick the right players for the right roles. And that's what those are about. And it, it's interesting to see, it would not be, a whole lot of stuff that you look at right now would not look the way that it does if these ideas hadn't been distilled out of, you know, basically the visual works images of the, uh, you know, the late 80s and found their way into this canon and then found their way into the literature and then found their way into a whole generation of subsequent frameworks and libraries. I mean, if you, if you go through just about any of the, uh, you know, newer uh, programming language library sets, you're going to see ideas that were drawn directly from the space. And, and that's what was cool about patterns, is that these observations about how to assemble the pieces wound up being surprisingly language independent if you squinted at them. The creational patterns were, were, were good evidence of that. Let's see, how are we doing here? Mm, good. And there's this one. This one was an odd, an odd duck. Um, <laughs> 
So Eric Gamma, who was you know, one of the gang of four, I think as most of you know, called Singleton the single biggest mistake of his professional career. It's, uh, so, so it's fair to ask the question, what, what's wrong with Singleton? You know, what's the problem with Singleton? You know, it's, uh, back at home, it's November, you know, next month we'll be waiting for that guy to bring us goodies. And you all know who he is. He's the one and only, the one and only you know, authentic single instance of Santa Claus. There's only one, you know. So you think about the singleton pattern, and you think about Santa Claus, and it's a match made in heaven. It's, uh, that's what you want. You want the single sole authoritative instance of Santa Claus when your little boy or girl sits down and tells that single sole authoritative instance what they want for Christmas. You know, if you didn't keep Santa Claus singleton, you had some imposter, like the late Jerry Garcia over here, you know, taking the, that Christmas list. Who knows what you get for Christmas? You know, it, it might not be exactly what your kid wanted. So the question I like to ask is, why does Eric want to kill Santa Claus? You know, what's wrong with him? What happened to this guy? You know, what were the reasons? You know, what were his complaints? about singletons? I think it's an interesting question. Anyone want to take a stab at it? <laughs> I heard some boos when we brought Singleton up. How come you want to kill Santa Claus? <laughs> what were the abuses? Um, see if I can remember how some of them went. Uh, some of the horror stories were you know, people came up to Eric and went um, things like, uh, oh, we read, your we read that book, we think it's really great, you know. And we've, we're trying to get, we got about 18 of the patterns in our source code, and if we work really hard, we're going to get all 23 by next month. You know, the, there some, people did some weird things when the Gang of Four book first came out. And some of the weirdest were done, you know, in the name of Singleton. You know, people thought things like, if you think that, you know, if you think that there's only ever going to be one instance of a particular, you know, class, you have to make it a singleton, you know. Um, and that was bizarre. You know, if, you know, the easiest way to make, you know, if what you want is to have a class and then only have one instance of it, you know, you could just have a class call the construct, you know, call the uh, constructor or the uh, you know, creation method once, and you're done. You know, you don't need to do that, but. People did that. Um, and you know, there, there were other things done in the name of Singleton that were bizarre. I think one of the ones that uh, used to strike me as odd was um, people worry about concurrency in Java. I guess there were some, some little wrinkles with uh, early versions of the JVM that would cause it not to do good things if you tried to use the stock Singleton um, creation code twice, and as a result, everybody said, Singleton is impossible to implement in Java, and so, you know, that's one reason why it's, it, it's of the devil. Um, I think it is overused, but I, I think there are cases for what you want to do. I mean, it's basically a question of, of, of selecting out single sole authoritative instance, locking yourself to a particular, you know, implementation of, 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 of the class, and, you know, controlling access to resources. I think there's legitimate reasons to have one of something that is a match for a concrete resource, and you're okay using it for that. But because of the range of abuses, people have tried to banish it altogether. It's an interesting issue. Yeah, singletons, unique objects, definitive instance, stateless behavior object, behaviorless state object. You know, with uh, the state pattern, singletons are a good match. You know, Java nooms wind up being de facto singletons. So there, there are places where it's not totally the work of Satan to, to use singletons. So I guess I'm not as down on it as, as some people are. But I digress. This is one you didn't see all that much in small talk. This wound up being somewhat more important for uh, some of the C++ers. This is kind of a cool story, though. I mean, I, I know we have some Russians here, so I thought I would you know, relate a story from the end of World War II. Um, toward the end of World War II, when you know, the American um, 
super fortresses were, you know, more than annoying the Japanese. Some of them uh, managed not to get all the way back to their bases and the Marianas and would have to ditch places. And among the places they would elect to ditch occasionally would be, you know, Vladivostok, somewhere like that. And uh, in those days, since, uh, you know, the United States and, uh, and the then Soviet Union were, were not at war, they were, in fact, uh, allies, um, but, you know, kind of you know, squishy allies. Smolin would respectively repatriate the crews to Tehran, but he kept the planes. And um, a few years later, I think in uh, 1947 or 1948, there were observers at the annual parade of military prowess in, you know, by the Kremlin Wall, those pictures we all saw when we were kids of the Soviet leaders standing by the wall watching the military parade. They would do flyovers. And um, observers were you know, surprised at first to see things that looked just like B-36s flying over. And you know, there's one, there was two, there was three, and everybody concluded th these must be the aircraft that uh, Stalin embargoed from Vladivostok, and they must have put some new paint on them. And then the fourth one flew over, configured for passenger travel, and they realized something remarkable had happened. And uh, what that was was, Stalin had told his engineers, on penalty of death, as was the custom during those days, to take the B-26s and completely clone them, just make total copies. Um, and that's what they did, you know, right down to building, you know, American English system jigs instead of me metric system jigs. What they had done was, in effect, implement the prototype pattern. I mean, the thing that was good about prototype is if you got, you got one of something that is hard you know, hard to come by data, there's no way you can construct it. You know, if I wanted to write a constructor to generate a GIF image of all the people in this room and use it for the person object that also has a picture of that identification, I'm not going to do that by doing what Disney or Pixar does. I'm not going to create a cartoon character that likes, looks like you in a constructor. I want to have those bits someplace else so that if I need another object that looks like that, I can do it. And, uh, you know, even in the 80s, there were examples of things like character fonts, you know, that had that characteristic. And so even in Smalltalk, which wasn't committed to prototypes, that was there. These days, you know, I now find myself, uh, you know, like maybe some of you already are or soon will be, you know, doing big data stuff for a living. Um, you've got to have something like this in order to be able to deal with the data is the thing you're focused on. They came from the outside world. If you want another copy of them for some reason, you want another instance, you've got to use this one. I was a big fan. There was a programming language called Self that uh, Dave Unger and his students worked on during the uh, you know, 80s and 90s. And in some ways, it was even simpler than Smalltalk. It was, it was pretty cool. It, it was fun to tinker with, although the, the implementations weren't widely available for too long a time, which was kind of frustrating. But I digress, as I often do. Um, Flyweight in some ways, you know, this is probably the, uh, you know, the least commonly seen of the Gang of Four patterns. You could sort of argue that character pools, or that pools of anything had this, this kind of characteristic. I, I could imagine a refactoring of the pattern space in which single, Flyweight took on the burden of being about the part of Singleton that was about pools of shared objects. And then you could do the, you know, then you could um, take some of the other intents that were squishier and keep them over on the singleton side. But the thing that wound up happening with the Gang of Four patterns is once they were out there, you know, they weren't going to change. That we, we used to uh, talk about, it would be nice to refactor the space, it would be nice to have a Gang of Four revisited conference out at Allerton where they did some of the original work. And, see whether or not this division still made sense, and it doesn't matter. We're stuck with them. It's like so many other things. You know, this is a, they are what they are. Those 23 are there. You know, that's it. Strategy was, you know, I think good images full of these. You know, anything named policy wound up being a strategy, and, you know, when the uh, design patterns uh, in Smalltalk guys started looking at that, we went, yep, they call those, basically we're calling them policies and visual works, and they're all over the place. The, th the thing that was interesting about strategy is, in terms of the evolution of reusable objects, this is one of the things we, we, we noticed when we first started exploring frameworks at uh, Illinois, 
there seemed to be this progression from white box to black box. There seemed to be a progression from using inheritance to using pluggable components. And strategy wound up being a kind of destination for a lot of those. You know, first you would get a hierarchy and then you'd realize, I can't accommodate all this variation, A, and B, I want to change it. You know, I might want to change my mind about what my strategy is. If I instantiate an object and it's using inheritance to, you know, um, inherit an algorithm for doing something, a way of doing something, a policy for doing something, I'm stuck with it. You know, yeah, I can use becomes, yeah, there's things I can do. But uh, strategies made it a lot easier to build pluggable things. And I like being able to do variation at runtime. You know, I'm a big, you know, dynamic everything's bigot. So um, strategy got you there. And strategy was important. Strategies were all over the place. And you know, here again, this is just something that fell right out of the image. State, interesting. You know, to, um, to some extent, I didn't really see good examples of state in the small talk image. You know, I think in, in hindsight, people point out a few, but this is one of the ones I was genuinely surprised to see, you know, having come from the small talk planet when uh, the Gang of Four drafts uh, came through. Um, you would ask yourself questions like, isn't that just changing your strategy real fast? You know, I think was my first reaction. And yeah, it kind of is, but you know, then you buy, the, buy into the intent Kool-Aid, be kind, you know, patterns and what have you. And, uh, and you go from there. Bridge, same thing, is pluggable implementation. You know, isn't that implementation strategy? There, there's really a range of these pluggable parts things. They go from strategy through bridge through, you know, state. When you look at the UML, you can't really tell which one it is but that's where you have to fall back on the intent. And uh, bridge, eh, it wasn't, you know, it was elusive. I couldn't uh, find it. I mean, I think the first nice example of uh, bridge that we came across was, uh, was uh, Phil Yelland did a, a paper on um, how you could use bridges to do pluggable GUIs. And they, they eventually built this. And he, he eventually wound up having a lot of impact on the design of Swing. And this is what bridges are for. You, know, you could change your look and feel from you know, Motif and Unix to Windows uh, to Mac by unplugging all the Im implementation objects and then plugging in a new set of implementation objects and have anyone who owns an instance of any of those objects that are calling through to those implementation objects still work. It really is a cool idea. It's one of the, the best examples of using the bridge pattern that I'd seen. You know, way better than what Java did with the AWT originally. And so that was the first place we were able to find then. Composite, sure, those are composite please sketches, little joke. But composites were all over visual works. You, know, you learned composite immediately when you started looking at how some of the drawable stuff works. And as soon as you saw how that worked, you just tell the, you tell the part, draw yourself, and uh, it tells its children to draw themselves, and on down the tree until you've rendered everything. That idea stuck, sticks with you the first time you see it. It's, wow, that's what, you know, that's a nice way to, to compose things. That's a nice way to do this. You know, it, it's, there's people who call it polymorphic inheritance, but it's better than that, because it's dynamic. You plug the parts together, you can just not care whether it's you know, a part or a whole. Just say do it. You, know, you just, uh, you know, you're Churchill. You say, I don't care how you do it. You must sink the Bismarck. And the guy at the Admiralty says, yes, sir. And he tells all the ships to go out to find it. You know, just down the tree. You know, it's, it's great. And they are plentiful in the image. More examples of that. Tainers, ah, we won't do that. Chain of responsibility. It was there, you know. It, it wasn't as cool a way to do GUIs as Zerber turned out to be, but that was yet another. That one I almost thought was trivial. In some ways, it's another pluggable parts pattern. You know, you've got, uh, you know, it, it was one of those. You know, do you know where to get that? No, but my buddy does. You know, fine, go get it for me. You know, it's people don't care. It's, it's reminded me of being an undergraduate. Can you get X? Can you get tickets for this sold-out concert? No, but I got a friend who can do it. You know, it's that kind of thing. Less said, the better. Now this was, a gang, this was an outtake. This was one of the ones that would have come in 
from the, if they had a little more time, this would have, there would have been 24 gang of four patterns, which would have been a cooler number, you know. 23 is just, you know, merely the number of chromosomes in the human genome. I mean, what significance does that have, you know? Uh, null object was something you learned the first time you tried to figure out how model view controller worked. And that's where it came from. And uh, it's great. You know, an object that does nothing well. You don't have to do null checks. You know, I'm looking at, I've been, you know, forced by, you know, my day job to look at something called Kotlin. You know, it's, it's uh, all the cool kids are using it. And basically, they're going to, you know, a lot of effort to showcase the fact that they implement null objects properly or, or can avoid it under some circumstances. You know, if you've got an object, make sure you can always talk to it. If you want to avoid, you know, pointer errors and memory exceptions, this is a tremendous pattern, and it came out of looking at, you know, null controllers in the 1980s small talk images. So we know the direct provenance. We know where it came from. Mediator, you know, I always think of this, um, these kinds of things. It's, it's the man in the middle. Um, you know, I used to tell a story about how five of the six of the people in this, uh, you know, in, in these slides were dead, and, you know, one of them was impeached by the U.S. Congress, and, oh yeah, well, no, the two, the two Americans aren't dead, that's right. Um, but, but, you know, in any case, that doesn't matter. It was a Latin American, he was a president of Costa Rica who got a Nobel Peace Prize for mediating some, some disputes. He taught design patterns in Costa Rica a few times, so, for what it's worth. But, you know, the, the upshot was, with, with Mediator, the original model view controller was a great idea, but the idea of model was a little under you know, underwrought. So what wound up happening as model view controllers turned into real things is, you know, it, it wasn't that any object could be the model. You needed something that could play an intermediate role. So what would happen when people started building MVC style GUIs out of objects is you'd have the domain objects down at the bottom and then you'd have an object above them, you know, which uh, was a dependent of changes to the domain object but could also forward um, you know, events that had been referred to it to other middle tier objects as well as to GUI objects. So the simple MVC started to look like you've got stock widgets, you've maybe got an adapter under, layer under them to um, make the protocols be standard. And then you'd have this tier of objects in the middle, some of which might depend the controller is, you know, this application running on a Linux box somewhere, maybe in a Docker, and the view is basically, you know, it's Chrome. You know, that's what, that's what some people think model view controller is. I had that happen on a conference call the other day. You're using model view controller, aren't you? And if, is this what you think it is? Because, you know, some words don't mean what you think they mean. It's, uh, adapters. This is a great idea. I mean, my, my favorite examples of uh, adapters were, you know, from American and Soviet space technology. Um, I, had, um, I had the opportunity to um, teach, this, teach a patterns course at the Johnson Space Center. And I was one of those kids who grew up on the space program in the United States. So this was one of the most exciting gigs I ever had. It was real NASA guys were working on all these things. And, I put this picture up, and one of the guys in the class raised his hand and said, I worked on that. I actually did that. He had to design the uh, maneuver that got the uh, shuttle mirror docking adapter to connect with the shuttle. And because there was something about the clamps on um, one of the vehicles that required a lot of force, he had to um, write a program to allow the shuttle pilots to tilt the entire space shuttle at a certain velocity to make the latches lock, and uh, you know, it was kind of cool to have that discussion about the adapter pattern. Usually, what I would just do would be, you know, put something like this up and say, "Any questions?" <laughs> you know, <laughs> this is actually the adapter that saved the lives of the Apollo 13 crew. These are uh, pictures from their actual implementation <laughs> sent up tear up the flight plan, you know, use these uh, carbon dioxide scrubbers. Wonderful pattern, comes in handy all the time. Decorators actually wind up being somewhat plentiful in the later versions of uh, visual works. 
it was a cool I, I, it was another idea I didn't learn early on at least that was my experience uh, came in later uh, proxies well, those are World War II collaborators facades uh, proxies and decorators are almost indistinguishable in terms of their implementations it's another one of those uh, intent based things you know, proxies are about things that computers do and decorators are about domain specific stuff really you know if, if you're about protection or you know you're about um, caching you're probably calling your wrapper a proxy. There's, there's really a family of four things that are what used to be called wrappers in uh, the Gang of Four canon. A, you've got the adapter, you've got the decorator, you've got the proxy, and you've got the facade. You know, we used to call this whole section the wrappers. It's really what they are. And in a lot of the older small talk code, those were all called wrappers. And uh, for good reasons, the Gang of Four found it necessary to distinguish between these different intents. So, People were surprised at first that there was no wrapper pattern you know, in, the, in the Gang of Four canon, because uh, there were really four of them. And the last one, you know, you don't see as much. I mean, the, people make the argument that the compiler itself was a facade in front of a lot of other resources in the small talk image. I don't know if I've ever really bought that. I tend to think of, of facades these days as a small window through which you see an external interface, like a, a file system or a database that just has a domain-specific protocol inside that just exposes what you need to use a big, fat external resource as inside your application. And they're great for, you know, they're great for mocking and testing. So it, it's wound up being kind of valuable and relevant in, in the grand scheme of things. Command, you know, we, we had blocks. We kind of, you know didn't use command as much as, they, they kind of had to invent this in the C++ world in order to do the kinds of things that people with, uh, you know, nearly first class closures were, were able to do. Um, it's one of the things about, you know, the neo-functional renaissance, you know, the fact that all the cool kids are doing functional, you know, it's like, why aren't you doing functional? I don't know. I feel like small talkers have been doing that from the beginning, really. You know, blocks have always been there. Most of the cool tricks you can do with functional stuff have always been there. You know, it's interesting to ask what the, um, what the big appeal, what the big deal with functionalism is. And I, I think in some ways it's, uh, it, there's a retro thing happening. It's people long for the days when you could write 10 to the 3 lines of code yourself. And one of the things you can do in functional languages is not have to worry about naming them and giving them structure. You, know, you can keep it in your head, you can kind of beat on it. You can say, because it's functional, I don't have to think about you know, how to communicate my intent to other readers. I think there's, there's a little bit of that going on. And uh, you know, they, they, do, you know, they embrace it under the pretext of, well, it's, you know, we can do more concurrency here. You can parallelize. You know, it's, uh, we can make everything you know, be immutable. We can do all these kinds of things, which we could always have done if we wanted to. But you know, there comes a time when you want to have instances of things, you want to put data someplace. So, we could always do most of what they did, but we could also do all of what objects can do. You know, I, I think there is a um, there is a tendency, you know, in the test-driven tradition to impose structure quickly, because that's what you have to do to be able to test something. Is you got to give it a, a, a an external API, and in some ways, I think that's where some of the pushback on testing comes from and where you know, some of the giddiness about neo-functionalism and just you know, creating a little swamp and living in it and swimming around and going, this is great. You know? I, I swim with the alligators and, and I like it, has is, is come from. Um, so you know, I'm a little ambivalent about neo-functionalism, as you may be able to tell. <laughs> what do we got left? Were there a lot of mementos in the small talk image? I don't really remember. This is another bit player in certain ways. But, you know, the idea of, I'm going to hand you something and, uh, you know, you hang on to it and, you know, if I get it back, I'll be able to put myself into exactly the same state I was in when I put it aside. There, there are places for that, you know, think web cookies. You know, this, th there were more <laughs> plausible um, synonyms for this one, keepsake, you know, snapshot, cookie, you know, my, you know, my um, aunts and uncles all know what web cookies are. They know what the memento pattern is. You know, it's, it's, it's amazing. 
Observer, one, maybe one of the most important contributions from the Gang of Fort Cannon. We know where they got it. This is a, another pattern that came straight out of the small talk image. It came out of it in a relatively immature form, and then a, um, a succession of people cultivated it and turned it more into a more targeted, published, subscribe kind of scheme over the last generation. But there, there's no question that that style of lashing things together with event notifications and um, you know, being able to register for them and be able to, to respond to them came out of the, the, the manner in which you know, um, these kind of notifications were built in the original small talk image. So. What else did we have? Oh yeah, interpreter. There were spec walkers. There was, of course, the parse trees. Visitor, we could walk those things. We could enumerate them. You know, visitor's an odd duck. Um, I'm not sure I ever recognized there was a thing like that um, in the small talk images, although there evidently was. The first time the Gang of Four workshopped their paper, I had to go home and build one in C++ that I convinced my, in order to convince myself I had any idea what it was doing. But once you get your head around it, it's an interesting idea. You know, it's uh, kind of a, the flip side of interpreter. Iterators of cost. I mean, the big difference between Smalltalk and uh, you know, the, the Java family of languages and a lot of other languages is Smalltalkers rely on what are now known as internal iterators, you know, callback style block iteration, whereas the good old fashioned C Fortran style do loops is more popular in certain other languages. And you know, there, there are benefits and weaknesses of each. Uh, we had that one already. Okay, where I usually, this used to be my, my traditional admonition at the end of things is patterns are cool, you know, keep them in your head, learn them, have them become part of how you think about how to write programs, but then as Charlie Parker said of scales and various other things, you know, learn them and then forget them because they become part of your personal programming style, it becomes something you do implicitly, you know, it's, I think a lot of you know this and uh, that's how it's good to think about them. But what I, where I want to end here is it's easy, you know, it's easy to take for granted from where I stand now um, just how much um, the people at Park and the people who worked on visual works and, and the Park images and, you know, the visual age images and everything that has come out of that tradition have changed the industry and changed the world. Um, you, know, you could down, go down the list of some of the things that are a direct consequence of this work, like you know the, the windows everybody uses every day. It just came right out of this particular you know cyber world heritage site. It's, it's really quite a remarkable achievement. You know, you can say, well, they were there first. You know, they had IQ points. You know, we all could have done it. I don't know. I don't know if I could have done it. You know, it's. It's cool. It's amazing. You know, it's it's worthy of a certain degree of reverence, and you know, that's one of the things you get to do when you know you've been around long enough to know some of the history of some of these things. Is go, wow, that was major league pitching. You know, that was that was really something, and it was. <laughs> How far over am I? <laughs>